The Chiapas region of southern Mexico is one of the last places on Earth where untouched cloud forest still exists. Once this land belonged to the Aztecs, who worshipped the plumed serpent god Quetzalcoatl. Their empire was vanquished long ago and reclaimed by the jungle. But a forest spirit they revered as sacred still haunts Chiapas. Now, as then, these remote high cloud forests remain the home of the bird they called the resplendent Quetzal. In Central America, true cloud forest is only found cloaking hillsides between two and two and a half thousand meters. One such area is the mountainous Chiapas region in southern Mexico, close to the border with Guatemala, where the Quetzal is still the national bird. The rugged profile of Chiapas is made up of steep volcanic peaks. The eastern and western slopes are hidden by thick tropical forests. The central plateau is dry scrubland, while the upper slopes support extensive coniferous woodlands. And above them, with their heads in the clouds, the highest peaks are covered by dense, dripping cloud forests. The rain and mist are the lifeblood of the cloud forest, which isn't just one habitat, but several, stacked on top of each other, like the layers in a cake. Each layer, from the forest floor to the top of the canopy, 35 meters above, is home to several different communities of wildlife. On clear days, the canopy and upper reaches of the trees are bathed in sunlight. This is the habitat of a splendid variety of bird and other animal life, rarely seen from the ground. In fact, most of these creatures live, feed and breed up here without ever venturing down onto the forest floor. Beneath them, it's a different world. The hanging mist and heavy rain nourish an almost impenetrable tangle of plant life. Huge ferns struggle to catch what little light filters down through the foliage above. The constant mist and high rainfall mean that humidity is almost 100% and the ground is perpetually waterlogged. Under these conditions, everything decays very quickly. Underfoot, the entire forest is crawling with life. Snails feed on vegetable matter, both living and dead. Millipedes, the size of a man's finger, feed on dead leaves which are recycled to form a rich compost of droppings. The red and yellow bands warn predators that they're highly poisonous. They do in fact secrete a deadly cyanide. It's certainly enough to deter these particular predators. The coati is a small carnivorous animal related to the raccoon with a keen sense of smell.
it's not uncommon to find bands of 20 animals roaming the cloud forest floor. But these groups consist of females and young only. Outside the breeding season, the males live apart. In fact, these solitary individuals were once thought to be a separate species called coati mundi, or lone coati. Play is very important for the young coatis. It develops the skills they'll need in later life, such as rolling logs in search of lizards and beetles. Insect life abounds in the forest. Forest butterflies probe the earth in search of minerals and salts. As well as flower nectar, they'll also feed on dead matter and animal droppings. Nothing is wasted. Wasps collect the dead wood and chew it to build their paper nests. Giant beetles spend the day sleeping among the leaves. When night falls, they'll take off and fly through the forest in search of rotten wood where they'll lay their eggs. Where the sun penetrates, orb spiders spread their webs to entrap passing insects. On the ground, Hordes of iridescent beetles gather to find a mate. Once mated, the females will disperse and produce the next generation. Other animals on the forest floor are less social and live solitary lives. The coral snake feeds mainly on small rodents and lizards and its colour serves to warn other animals that it's highly venomous. The rat snake, as its name suggests, eats rodents, which it kills by constriction. It's an excellent climber and would certainly raid the nest of any bird in the branches above. The keeled scales and vertical pupil are the hallmarks of a venomous snake. Godman's viper inhabits the highest areas of the Chiapas, as its local name, Nauyaca del Frio, viper from the cold, suggests. But despite its venom, it could easily fall prey to this forest floor dweller. The collared peccary is a small wild pig that lives in groups of a dozen or so. Peccaries become active during the early evening and spend the night foraging in the leaf litter. Green iguanas only venture down from the branches to lay their two or three dozen eggs in the soil. If the peccaries find their nests, they will soon dig out the eggs and eat them. Their eyesight is poor and their hearing is less than acute, but their sense of smell is highly developed. Three or four metres above the peccaries is another layer of a different habitat, home to a new cast of characters. Here, ferns, bromeliads and orchids cling on to the branches and trunks of the trees to try and reach some all-important sunlight, their exposed roots catching moisture and nutrients dripping down from the trees above.
The ruddy-capped nightingale thrush has built its nest amid the dense vegetation. Cloud forest birds normally only have two chicks at a time, although two or even more broods may be raised in a single year. It's a sound strategy. By having fewer offspring, but more often, the birds avoid putting all their eggs in one basket, as it were. Many nests fall victim to predators. This way, at least they can make up the loss later in the season. It's not until some time after dawn that the rufous sabre-winged hummingbird is ready to fly. This tiny bird goes into a state of torpor or hibernation each evening in order to save energy. Only when it's warmed up can it take off and begin to feed. For a bird that burns so much energy, Nectar is the ideal fuel to keep its wings buzzing at up to 70 beats a second. This intermediate zone between the forest floor and the tree canopy is the home of what we normally think of as a ground animal. These night hunters descend from the trees after the sun has dipped below the horizon. The grey fox is a forest dweller throughout much of the United States and Mexico, but it's seldom seen because of its nocturnal habits. Mice, squirrels, small birds and eggs are its favourite prey. But, like all foxes, it's an opportunist, taking what comes. And at certain times of the year, it feeds almost entirely on fruit. These are essentially solitary animals. But should one grey fox meet another during their nightly wanderings, then the subservient animal quickly adopts a submissive crouch with ears laid back. Such behaviour eliminates the need for physical contact to establish supremacy. The grey fox is also known as the tree fox because of its remarkable climbing ability. As dawn approaches, the foxes return to the safety of the branches where they'll spend the day. Twenty-five metres above the sleeping foxes, the forest canopy is adorned with bromeliads. A group of black-handed spider monkeys are about to set off on a day of foraging and feeding. Spider monkeys have long, flexible arms and legs and an even longer tail. It's remarkably prehensile, naked at the tip, and is used as a fifth limb as the animal moves through the trees in search of fruit. Thirty-five metres above the ground, a pair of emerald toucanets have built their nest inside a hollow tree. Despite their large bills, these birds can't dig out their own hole, but simply take over an old woodpecker hole, 
often eating the resident chicks in the process. The toucanet's own chicks are well grown and are being fed on fruit and insects. Both male and female help rear the young. Why toucanets should need such a large bill is a mystery, especially as they feed mostly on soft fruit. It's probably some kind of signal, like a cockatoo's crest or a peacock's tail. But the toucanet's bright colours fade into insignificance alongside this bird. The quetzal is one of the world's most spectacular birds. The male is an iridescent green and his tail feathers are almost as long as a man's arm. It's easy to see why it's known as the resplendent quetzal. Glancing sunlight transforms his plumage from emerald to deepest sapphire. The female is less striking and lacks the long tail feathers. Nevertheless, both she and the male were once held in high esteem. The Aztec god Quetzalcoatl, the plumed serpent, was half Quetzal, half snake, a mixture of good and evil. Quetzal tail feathers were so highly prized they would be worn by nobles. Montezuma's crown was an elaborate headdress made of feathers from more than 200 birds. The plumes were plucked from living birds which were then released. If you killed a Quetzal, the penalty was death. The Spanish conquistadors were not so conservation-minded. Soon after their arrival in the 16th century, the Quetzal disappeared, along with the Aztec civilization. For many years, the Quetzal was thought to be extinct, until the mid-19th century, when they were rediscovered living high in the canopy in remote pockets of cloud forest. In the Chiapas, the Quetzals nest in April, often in holes 30 metres from the ground. The Quetzal either digs out its own hole or enlarges an old woodpecker nest. The female does all the work at this stage, pecking out a chamber and ejecting the chippings. When she has finished, she waits for her mate to examine her work. The male Quetzal has to be sure that the nest is big enough to take both him and his splendid tail, as both birds will take turns to incubate and feed the young. A few minor adjustments and the chamber is almost complete. The female will lay two pale blue eggs among the loose chippings at the bottom of the hole. Throughout the cloud forest, other pairs are following suit. This particular tree has been used by Quetzals for several years, but dead trees slowly rot in the wet and the birds will have to move on after a few seasons. The birds are now sitting on eggs, and all this coming and going from the hole is taking its toll on the male Quetzal's magnificent tail. The chicks are now two weeks old, and the adults are feeding them on lizards and insects. When the male enters the nest, he turns so that his long tail plumes hang out over the top of his head, a perfect imitation of the ferns growing on the tree. There's little seasonal variation here, and trees flower and fruit throughout the year. A Chiapas squirrel gorges on the fruits that are ripening near the Quetzal nest, 25 metres above the ground. Even higher up is a very scarce and rarely seen visitor. 
The horned guan is a strange turkey-sized bird that lives only in the cloud forest canopy. The function of the red fleshy horn is still a mystery. A pair of striped-backed tanagers are feasting on the same fruits. The female is the duller of the two. The horned guan retreats into the foliage, a rare glimpse of a very elusive bird. Close by, high in the canopy, on the flimsy outermost branches of a tree, is the nest of one of the world's rarest birds. The azure rumped tanager has never been filmed or even photographed. In fact, it hasn't been seen for 50 years. They've only ever been seen on two occasions. It was in 1868 that the first one was discovered. In 1937, the second and last one was recorded and collected as a museum specimen. This is the first sighting since then. The pair seemed to be successfully raising two chicks, and a second nest was seen nearby, so that makes at least eight individuals that we know of more than anyone has ever set eyes on before. The structure of the nest, which is covered in lichens, and the fact that the two sexes look similar are details not known until now. Clearly, both male and female tanagers feed the chicks, which are no more than two days old. With luck, there'll be other pairs nesting on these remote hillsides. But in some parts of the Chiapas, the logging companies are moving in. It would be a tragedy to lose this bird, which for 50 years was thought to have become extinct. The Quetzal's two chicks are now nearly four weeks old and almost fully fledged. They wait at the entrance of the nest to be fed. Their diet has changed. It's now mostly fruit in the form of the small avocados that grow wild here in Quetzal country. Two days later, and a young Quetzal has left the nest. It will be some time before it develops the brilliant plumage of the adult and the gorgeous tail feathers that Montezuma wore. Only then will it become a resplendent Quetzal, the spirit of the cloud forest, to be revered as much today as it was by the Aztecs long ago.